Hey, welcome to Catalyst Church Online. My name is Jason, one of the pastors, and thanks for hanging out with us this morning. Hey, if you're joining us for the first time, we would love to hear from you. We would love to know that you are spending your time with us today, and the way that you can do that is by texting Catalyst SP to 97000. What happens at that point is you will be texted back a link to our our digital connect card. And on that digital connect card, you can let us know that you're here with us online. You can ask any questions. You can check boxes for next steps you may want to take. Maybe you want to meet with one of the pastors. You got some questions about faith or about the church, or maybe you want to uh, share a prayer request. We go through all those prayer requests that come in every Tuesday when we have our staff meeting. But take take advantage of Catalyst SP to 97000. It's a great way to connect with us. Hey, just a couple things that are coming up at Catalyst that I don't want to let you know about. First is this. Tomorrow night on Zoom at 7 p.m., Pastor Chris and myself are going to be hosting what we call Discover Catalyst. And Discover Catalyst is a 45-minute Zoom meeting to discover uh, our story, our purpose, our mission, why we do what we do, why we exist in the community of Santa Paula, give you some of that information, but also then um, explain to you some potential next steps. If you feel like maybe Catalyst is a place that you want to land and call your church home, uh, we can explain some ways to get involved, whether that's through serving in a ministry, whether that's being involved in groups, and uh, it's an opportunity for us to get to know you as well. So uh, it's interactive, but we would love to spend Monday night with you at 7 p.m. for, like I said, about 45 minutes. The way that you can register for that is by going on the Catalyst Church Center app or the uh, homepage on our Instagram account. There's a link on there and sign up. And then what's going to happen is you'll be uh, emailed the Zoom invite link for to join us Monday night for Discover Catalyst. Other thing we want to remind you of, we are now back in our building meeting um, on Sunday mornings. If you'd like to join us, we have services at 9 and 1045. And the way that you can register for those is by going on the Church Center app as well, or the link in the weekly email that goes to the whole church, or on our website as well. There's a bunch of different ways you can sign up for that. We'd love to see you in person if that's what you're uh, comfortable doing, doing, but uh, we're just glad that you're joining us online as well. If you've been joining us online for a while, you know that every week we like to share what we call a community snapshot. And the whole point of the community snapshots is to give you a little glimpse of what life looks like in and around Catalyst Church. So what we have for you today is a community snapshot that's highlighted a new ministry here at church, that uh, Catalyst Church, that we're pretty excited about, that we think has a real bright future of just loving on the people of our community. So take a peek at this video. Hey, Catalyst, wanted to give some of my friends here, Ram and Melissa Dugadillo, a chance to talk about something really cool that they launched this week here on campus on Tuesday night. So tell us what you guys kicked off this week. So on Tuesday night, 7 p.m., we started an Overcomers Outreach program here at the church. It's a 12-step program that's Christian-based, and it just brings the church and the 12-step program together. It's a bridge between the two. Um, it's basically a program that's for anybody that has unhealthy behavior okay. um, or addiction, any type of stronghold, which could be um, alcohol, drugs, um, codependency, depression, gambling, pornography, any type of unhealthy behavior that, or a stronghold that you just need to get rid of and that's kind of been like just, it's just really strong in your life. And it's just um, a way of breaking that and, and just um, opening up Jesus Christ into that area. Hmm. Very cool. Ram, tell us a little bit about why it was important for you and Melissa to, to get this thing going. So um, a few years ago, I, uh, I went to a recovery group and... Uh, the recovery uh, group was uh, really important in my life because it saved my marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, it just uh, it saved uh, my life uh, through uh, through addiction, and uh, so therefore I totally recommend anybody to come to the group. Um, so when you come out here to the group, it's uh, you kind of feel like you're going to be judged, but it's nothing to be judged about. Uh, we all go through it, so when you come into uh, to our group, uh, you're pretty much welcomed and everybody makes you feel welcomed. As soon as you come here, you'll know uh, that we're all here for each other. Nobody's going to judge you in any way. So when somebody does choose to show up on a Tuesday night, like what, what can they expect to see happen in your gathering? So what we usually do, we start, uh, we uh, have everybody sign in and uh, uh, we actually start in prayer. Uh, and then uh, we introduce ourselves, and we do a little worship music. 
Uh, we have a few songs that we do. And uh, we just start welcoming each other. And uh, we just love on one another. Uh, nobody's here to be judged, like oh. I said. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just uh, a really good program for mm -hmm. anybody to, uh, to come and join. Mm -hmm. Also, um, everything is confidential. Mm -hmm. So whoever is there, um, you know, it's confidential. And um, also, like, the names and um, whatever is said there, it's a safe place. We're without judgment. Mm -hmm. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a question at you that, that we didn't practice. But for somebody that's kind of sitting on the fence, maybe they, they realize they need this, but they're really hesitant and showing up. Like, what encouragement would you give somebody to get them through the door here on a Tuesday night? Just God is so good, and he can change lives. Mm. He really can, and um, we're a witness of that. Um, we didn't really tell. like Nobody really knew about um, our life and about Ram's addiction in the past. And, um, and once we just started opening up and started, like, God just started, you know, pressing on our heart to just um, say something. And it's like God just started to just heal us even more so. Like, yeah, he was sober for all those years, but we never really told anybody. And we never really, like, asked for prayer. It was, like, hidden. And, like, once we just let it out, like, God just started to heal those areas of our lives and release, releasing it so that way he could use us to help out other people. And, um, and I'm not saying we have it all figured out because we don't. We're not perfect. But... We just keep on trying, and we don't stop, and we just keep on just surrender, surrendering it all to God and just letting him work in those areas of our life. Uh, the other thing is uh, you have to be obedient. Mm. You have to be obedient to, to our Father, and he's the, one that's, uh, he's the one that has it under control. We just have to uh, just lay it on his feet. Mm. And uh, when you come out here um, and you think you, you feel like you can't, go to that next step pray pray and uh our heavenly father is going to guide you to that right place um i went through that and um it's 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 a good thing to do you just got to be honest and obedient and uh but if you're in that that fence uh take that next step mm -hmm. that's cool i was telling these guys earlier was i'm, I'm super excited I just want to affirm this again. I'm super excited that we have a brand new way to reach a whole other part of our, our community with the message of hope and healing that comes through Jesus Christ. Yeah. So I'm super excited that you guys are doing this. If somebody wants to come, how do they, how do they get connected? Well, there's two ways. <clears throat> um, you can either register through the app, um, the Callus app, Callus app, and you can register through there. Or if you don't want to register, we totally get it. You don't have to. You can just come. Tuesdays at 7 p.m. And like I said, it's a safe place without judgment. You know, we just try to love on everybody, encourage them, pray, and um, just share scripture, just share life together. Awesome. And I just want to thank Pastor Jason uh, for just uh, helping us uh, get this uh, going. Cool. Um, it was just awesome to, uh, to be able to do this. Uh, and like Pastor Jason said, to help the community. Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, I think there's a bright future of you guys really affecting the community in a positive way for Christ. So thanks for stepping out in faith to do that. So Tuesday nights, 7 p.m. here on campus, our Connect Center. Register on the app or just show up and get loved on by Ram, Melissa, and everybody at the Overcomers Outreach. Thanks, Thank guys. You. We're pretty excited about Ram and Melissa's uh, step of faith in beginning that Overcomers Outreach program on Tuesday nights. And boy, we'd love that. We'd love for you to spread the word on that. Maybe that's something that's going to be meaningful for you to check out as well. So make sure you just stop by the church um, on any Tuesday night, 7 p.m., to uh, uh, participate in that and just be really encouraged and find hope and healing through the Word of God and other, uh, other believers gathering together. Hey guys, we're continuing what we're calling Faith That Works. It is our study in the book of James, one of my personal favorite books of the Bible. And we're up to James chapter 4, and Pastor Chris is going to be teaching on that this morning. When Sierra and I had our very first child, she was this little bundle of joy named Isabella, and she was perfect. She was the most beautiful thing we've ever seen in our entire lives. It was our first child, and for those of you that are parents and you've had children, you know that when you have your first kid, she or he is so sweet, so perfect, so beautiful. There's no other kid in the world like them. And then you have a second kid, 
and you start to see what your first kid is really like. It is a whole new ball game. And all of a sudden, that first child that you thought was perfect and sweet and just so amicable and amazing, all of a sudden now you get to see what they're like around other kids. You start to get to see how selfish they are, they're maybe a tattletale, or they're angry all the time, or they're selfish, or at times they even get violent with their siblings when they don't get what they want, or there's some sort of conflict. And we as parents get to sit back and watch and go, wow, like we get a firsthand view of how they fight and how they deal with conflict. Sometimes as parents, when we observe our children, we think that the conflicts that they get in with their siblings are kind of funny. Like I remember uh, when our daughter was about four years old and our son was about two, she asked him if he would want to marry her one day. And he was like, no, I'm not going to marry you. She was so mad at him. She came and tattled on him and told him, she said, he doesn't want to marry me and was so angry with him. And we thought it was hilarious. And of course, as parents, you can't laugh in your kid's face. We'd go out of the room and we'd just, you know, laugh like crazy at that this trite and weird funny things that our kids would get in conflict over. So sometimes the, the fights that our kids get in with each other are just flat out funny and ridiculous. Sometimes they're really petty, you know, and you deal with this with young children all the time when they won't share or they won't play with me or he called me a poo-poo face or whatever. And you're just like, it's so petty. Like, it's not really that big of a deal, but you see how those kids handle even those types of conflicts. But sometimes it's really serious. Sometimes when your kids get into a fight, you are like, whoa, uh, Houston, we have a problem. And you and your spouse look at each other and you're like, uh, she learned that from you or he learned that from you. That's how you handle conflict or where did that come from or where did they learn how to fight like that? But as they or even we get older, there can be a lot more at stake when it comes to conflict. We have family conflict. We have conflict with our friends, conflict with our coworkers or our fellow students. We have conflict with enemies, neighbors. So conflict sometimes as we get older just tends to get worse and worse. And if you're anything like me, there have been times in my life where I've handled, I've handled conflict in a healthy, productive, mature, godly way. And as a result, there was reconciliation and there was peace. But if you're anything like me on the other side of that, you've handled conflict and I've handled conflict in ways that I, that have been unhealthy, that I've been ashamed of, that I've been prideful, immature, ungodly. I've said things that I shouldn't have said, or I've handled the conflict, not in a productive way, but in an unproductive way. And it resulted in division and pain. The good news in all of that is that our heavenly father knows that his kids are going to fight with each other and his kids are going to have conflict, sometimes over dumb things, sometimes over petty things, and sometimes they get in conflict over some pretty major things and the result is pain and division. But here's the thing is that God loves us so much that he has shown us how to do conflict the way he would. And he loves us so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, into this world in the flesh to show us a better way of resolving conflict. Because our Heavenly Father knows that if we handle conflict the way the world handles conflict, it will only cause pain and division. However, if we handle conflict in a godly way, the way that he wants us to, we will actually become more like our Heavenly Father. And so James, James, the author of the book that we are studying right now every single Sunday as a church, he's the stepbrother, the half-brother of Jesus Christ himself. He is going to teach us, essentially, that there are two ways to handle conflict. There's the world's way and there's God's way. There's no third option here. We can't avoid conflict or anything like that. We have to step into it. And so James is like, he's going to show us there's two ways. There's the world's way and there's God's way. But more importantly, in James chapter 4, he's going to expose to us the root or the why behind the way that we respond to conflict. Why do we choose to handle conflict in the world's way? 
And how can we step into God's way of handling that? See, James knows conflict. James knows conflict better than most of us do. He saw his brother, Jesus Christ, have an enormous amount of conflict and enemies and people that would want to tear him down. He saw the way his brother handled it. He heard his brother teach on conflict in places like Matthew chapter 18, where Jesus talks about how to confront someone and how to have godly conflict. James was the pastor in the church of Jerusalem. And if those of, you know, we've, us, of us who have been in ministry as a pastor, we know people have problems and people have conflict. And James, as the pastor of that large church, dealt with conflict all the time. He dealt with personal conflict. He dealt with leadership conflict. He dealt with theological uh, conflict in Acts chapter 15. Peter, or excuse me, James knows conflict. In fact, James would ultimately die as a result of conflict. James died because there were people that rose up against him because he would not stop preaching the good news about his brother Jesus. And as a result, because he wouldn't stop, a great mob seized him. They took him to the top of the temple and they pushed him off. And he fell from the top of a temple onto the ground. He didn't die. And they saw that he didn't die. So the mob then beat him to death. James understands conflict just like we do. In fact, he knows conflict way more than many of us do. And so God knows that we need help with how to do conflict God's way. And so James writes this in James chapter 4 to help us learn how to do do conflict God's way. So James chapter 4, starting in verse 1. He starts off by saying this, What causes fights and quarrelings among you? He says, what is it that causes these fights and quarrels among you? And the rest of the section here, James chapter 4, verses 1 through 10, give the answer to that question. But I want to turn that question to you if you're watching today. What is it that causes fights in and around you? Not other people, but what is it in you that causes fights and quarrelings? It's an important question to ask ourselves. It's the, why do I respond the way I do? Why am I defensive the way I am? Why do I get angry the way that I do? See, when we ask the why questions about how we respond in certain situations, that's what adults do. They're willing to do the hard work of asking why, to get real answers so that they can mature and become mature adults and change their behavior. And so we're asking that question, what is it that causes fights among us? What is it that causes fights in your life? Now here comes the answer for us. He says here that there is God's way, or excuse me, there is the world's way, or there's God's way of handling this conflict. Now the world's way essentially is how Satan would run things in this world. It's how he's put it together. It's how everybody in this world acts. It explains global conflict, political conflict, relational conflict, divorce, separation, division, all that kind of stuff. That is all from Satan. It is all his plan and it has all been set in motion by him. And then he talks, he's going to talk about God's way, which is essentially how God has set things up in heaven. And as children of the kingdom of heaven, this is how we are to respond and how we are to do conflict. And so he starts off talking about worldly conflict. He says, what is worldly conflict? He answers the question, what causes fights and quarrels among you? First of all, he says in verse four, or chapter four, verses one B, don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire to have, so you kill. He says that one of the reasons, or one of the aspects, or tenets of worldly conflict is these internal desires within us. The reason why we conflict, we have have conflict with each other, is that because we have desires that battle within us. There are these passions and the wars that go on for our lives. And he says these passions and desires are what's creating conflict. The the Greek word used in James chapter 4 verse 1 for desires is where we get the word hedonism. Hedonism is essentially a life where pleasure is the highest goal. 
And so what James is saying, he says, the reason why you have so much conflict and the way you handle it the way that you do is because you want what you want at any given cost or at any expense. And these passions are at war within us. This is why when, when you're angry or you're upset, we've all been there. And when someone says something that sets us off or that triggers us, we feel these desires, these motions, angers or lust or whatever it may be within us begin to well up. And he says, the, the people of this world allow those desires to win. And so, therefore, um, the way in which the world wins is when those desires take control. When your anger becomes out of control, your desire for pleasure gets out of control, your defense mechanisms run out of control, your desires to have something that someone else has, that's one of the ways in which the world handles conflict. And we see how that works. It's a failed way of handling conflict. It only creates more division. But he causes, James is going to cause us here in this to take a look in the mirror and say, do you have desires and passions deep within you that are causing conflict in your life? And what are you doing about those? Sometimes it's our desire to win, to be the best, They might be ungodly desires or passions. And as a result, as he says, you only want to kill. But he also says here, the second thing about worldly conflict is this aspect of coveting. He says here in verse two, chapter uh, chapter four, verse two, second half of that verse, he says, you covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. Coveting is essentially not having something yourself, seeing that someone else has that thing that you want, and so you want to take it away from them so that you can have it yourself. You may know that the 10th commandment is about coveting. Of all of the rules for living that God has given the nation of Israel for good living, it actually makes the top 10. That's how deep it is within us, and that's how much conflict it can cause within us. It's the reason why some, of, why some of us fight is that the way that we, that, or the thing that someone else has is what we want. It might be power. It could be money. It could be the position in that company that you want. It could be the influence that you want that someone else has or the fame that someone else has that you want. It could be that someone has a spouse and you don't or children and you don't or good health and you don't. And so they have something that you have. The, the, they have the good relationship with mom and dad and you don't. They have financial success and you don't. And so you want to cause conflict with them so that you can take away what they have. I, you, they, they have the good relationship with mom and dad, so I'm going to cause conflict so that I will regain that relationship with mom and dad. She has what I want, and so I'll create conflict in order to take it away from her and give it to myself. Those two things are at the root, he says, of worldly conflict. And then he moves on. He says, you do not have, not because you're, not taking, it from, you're taking it from someone else, you do not have because you do not ask God. So James is actually encouraging those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus to not covet and take away from someone, but if there's something that we want is to ask God for it, not to take it away from someone else. See, the way of the world takes away from others instead of going to God first. So when you're feeling that jealousy about someone at work that's getting more money or more power or more influence than you are, the, the, way of, the way that God would ask us to handle it is not to create conflict, gossip about them, go behind their back, try to you know, make yourself look better than them to your supervisor. The answer is to go, hey God, is this what you want for me? Because here's what he says next. He says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. I wonder sometimes that God, very often, God answers our prayers with a no because he knows they're actually going to be bad for us. Do you ever think about that? 
Say, God, I want a spouse. God, I want children. God, I want a promotion. God, I need this or that or whatever it may be that you continually ask God for. And for some reason, that, that is not being answered in the affirmative. And you wonder, does God love me? Does God care for me? In fact, James chapter 4, verse 3 says, possibly one of the reasons why God says no to your desires is because you're not ready for it. You're not ready for it. You're actually going to take what, God, what He were to give you and use it for personal pleasure, not to glorify God. And so ultimately, James is saying here that if you struggle with coveting and that's causing conflict in your life, ultimately, you don't have conflict with others, you have conflict with God. Because sometimes we want something and God says no. Our problem is actually with God's answer, not with them. And so James causes us to take a look at ourselves. He says, the world covets, but the Christian prays and trusts God's timing. So to answer that question, what causes fights and quarrels among you, his level one, James's level one answer to us is untethered desires and selfish ambitions. What causes conflict around so many of us is simply untethered desires and selfish ambitions. For some of you, that's, that's, that just hits the nail on the head. And you look at that, you say, yeah, like I'm, I'm guilty of that. But now the next section here is going to go even deeper. Look what it says in chapter 4, verse 4, four cha, excuse me, chapter 4, verse 4. He says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. James is using some very strong language here for Christians. And he says, in fact, what, the main reason why you have so much conflict in your life and the, way that, or the, and the worldly way in which you handle it goes even deeper. It's because you love the things of this world more than you love God. And he uses some strong language to call us out on that. He calls these Christians, he calls us adulterous people as if we're, we're cheating on the heart of God in these areas of our lives. Essentially, he's saying, Christians, are you reverting back away from your love for God into your love for the world? And that's why you have so much conflict in your life. The even deeper thing here is he also calls those of us who resolve conflict in a worldly way, he says you're actually becoming an enemy of God. See, when we're a friend of the things of this world, the Bible says it here, he says it in 1 John, Jesus makes reference to it as well, that if we are friends with the ways of the world, we are actually enemies of God. See, the root of so much of the conflict and the way that we handle conflict in our lives is that we actually just love the world's ways more than God's. And we would rather handle conflict the world's ways through anger, retaliation, lawsuits, canceling, ignoring, division, hatred. We would rather do those things than do it God's way. See, children of God learn from their heavenly Father and they imitate His Son. Children of the world observe the world around them and imitate that. And so it says, do you love the ways of God or do you love the ways of the world? The hard reality for us when it comes to conflict and conflict resolution is that so many of us, we learned how to resolve conflict from our parents. Now, some of you had godly parents and they taught you how to resolve conflict in a godly way. And that is such a blessing for so many of you out there. But for most people, they learn conflict resolution or lack thereof from ungodly parents that maybe were godly in many areas of their lives, but they didn't know how to handle conflict in a godly way. I see it in premarital counseling meetings all the time where there's one person uh, in that meeting whose parents fought very loudly all the time. Everything was a big issue and they fought and they yelled and they screamed and they stayed together in a loving way as a family. And so that person who's about to get married, that's how they resolve conflict. It's just loud and obnoxious and it's, you know, all this kind of stuff. And then the other one who's about to get married grew up in a home in which the parents never fought publicly. 
And so every time they get into a fight with each other, this one thinks it's totally normal and this one thinks there's something deeply wrong because they both learned how to resolve conflict from their parents. And they're both ungodly in their own way. Let me give you three pro tips, parents, on how to handle conflict so that your kids don't get jacked up from your ungodly conflict. Number one, parenting pro tip with your kids, number one is this, is let your kids see you argue or hear you argue, go to bed and wake up the next morning and see that the family is still together. It's a great way for your children to see that mom and dad can argue and get in fights and they still love each other at the end of the day and are committed to the marriage and committed to the family. When kids watch parents fight and argue in a healthy way, realizing that they can argue about things, but in the end they still love each other and are committed to the family and committed to the relationship, your kids will realize that fights don't end the world. Pro tip number one. Here's pro tip number two. Let your kids see you apologize to each other, parents. Don't just resolve things privately. Go and be in the family and do it around the dinner table and apologize to your spouse in front of your kids. Let them see you humbly ask for forgiveness. And on the other side of that, parent, give the love and forgiveness back in front of your kids. Show them how to parent, or excuse me, show them how to resolve conflict in a loving and godly way. Pro tip number three is choose to resolve conflict God's way. Here's how James lays that out. Look what he says, starting in verse 5. He says, Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he, that, he, that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That is why Scripture says, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will free from, flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. So there's traits on what the world's way of doing conflict. And then there's God's way. Here's some of the traits out of this section about how we do conflict God's way. Number one is this, is that those who handle conflict God's way, number one, are governed by the Holy Spirit that lives in them. They're governed by the Holy Spirit that lives in them. It's how Jesus lived his life, and it's how God desires for you and I to live our lives. So we are governed fully by the Holy Spirit. We live in the presence of God. So that when conflict arises, we are prayerfully walking into it and through it and out of it because we're being governed by the peace and the counsel of the Holy Spirit that lives within us. And so the question we have to ask ourselves on this is, are we governed by our emotions and our passions and our desires and our hedonism or are we governed by the Holy Spirit? Number two thing out of here is that those traits about, of those who handle conflict God's way are grace givers. They're grace givers. It says that that God gives us even more grace throughout our lives. And so we, as Christ followers, should be giving an enormous amount of grace to others. In worldly conflict, there is no grace. There's no grace. But in God's way, there's there's a lot more grace than should be given. Often worldly conflict only gives grace to one side, and it's always my side. If I'm in a fight, I want grace. I'm not going to give it to you who I'm in conflict with. I'm only going to give it to myself. But God's way gives grace to the other side first. Give grace. Give grace. Third thing in these verses here, the way that we do conflict God's way, is they choose humility. They choose humility. It says in in verse uh, 6 here, it says, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. I don't know about you, but I don't want to oppose God. I want God's favor. And so I must learn how to live humbly before my God and before others. See, worldly conflict is motivated by pride. Conflict God's way is motivated by humility. Number four is they submit themselves to God's and godly authority. I always say, be careful of someone who will never submit to the word of God or to any godly authority in their lives. 
But always be careful of those who refuse to be under any sort of authority. For the children of God, the man of God, the woman of God will submit themselves not only to God, but to godly counsel and godly authority over their lives. You want to do conflict God's way? First and foremost, submit yourself to God and then submit yourself to godly people and godly authorities around your life that will tell you when you are handling things the world's way. And when, whether it's God's word or it's godly people that rebuke you and remind you of how good God is and how to resolve this in a godly way, we listen and we change our behavior. Fourth thing, or fifth thing, is it says here that if we want to do conflict God's way, we need to resist the devil and draw near to God. We need to resist the devil and draw near to God. For our battle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers and principalities of this present darkness that we live in this world. And so it says, when we resist the devil, we draw near to God. See, the devil knows your weak spots. He knows your weak spots. He knows your addictions. He knows your wounds. And he knows your parents. And so, do you have a track record of always finding yourself in the same types of fights? and the same types of conflicts. Do you, you hear people say things like, well, she, she always, or excuse me, she doesn't have very many female friends, or she can't keep any friends, or he can't commit, or he's got an anger problem, or when she drinks, she gets testy. He can never find a church that he likes or a pastor that he can submit to. He can never keep a girlfriend. If, if those are the reoccurring themes, if one of those are a reoccurring theme of your life, you better believe that Satan is going to use that to pull you and divide you away from the things that matter most in your life. He will create conflict over and over and over again on your weak spots. And so be a mature adult and learn to grow beyond those because if we do and we seek to seek God in all of it, God will come and he will defend that weak spot on your wall and he will repair it and make us strong so that we can not only resist the devil, but we can also draw near to God so that we can resolve conflict in a godly way. And then lastly, and probably most importantly, God, God, people that handle conflict godly way, God, God's way, come to Jesus with a pure heart. It says here, wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. You're being double-minded. He says, submit your life to God. Come to Jesus and purify your heart before Him and before those who you have conflict with. So there's a world's way of doing conflict, and there's God's way of doing conflict. What causes fights and quarrels among you? What causes fights and quarrels in your life? And in the resolution of that conflict, are you doing it the world's way or are you doing it God's way? The beautiful thing is, is that God sent his son Jesus Christ in this world to model for us the godly way of resolving conflict. Jesus set that example for us when he went to the cross and he took two enemies. He took God and he took us in our sin and he mediated between the two and he stepped in that gap and he said, I will die for one side so that they can be reconciled to God. That's what Jesus Christ did for you and he set that example for all of us, all of us children of the kingdom of God so that we can not only be reconciled to God but that we can rediscover how to be reconciled to one another despite the fact that conflict arises. See, God desires you and I to do conflict His way. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all that you're doing in us. Will you help us to resolve conflict your way and to resist the devil and to resist the ways of this world and the conflict so that we can fully honor you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for watching today, guys. Have a great rest of your week. Again, I said it before, I'll say it again. Thanks for hanging out with us online. Really pray that the message from James chapter 4 was meaningful to you, gave you some stuff to think about, gave you some stuff to pray about, gave you some stuff to really take to heart and really become part of who you are as a Christ follower. As always, if you'd like to uh, donate to the, the ministry of Catalyst, you can do that online through our website or through the Catalyst Church Center app. Again, thanks for hanging out with us. We love you guys. We'll see you soon. Have a great week. God bless.